what we call time is simply our measurement between the difference of before and after. In early March 2020, we were living the before. The novel coronavirus was barely in the news. 41 people had died in northern Italy, but life was basically unchanged in the rest of Europe. The United States reported its first death from the novel coronavirus March 1st, 2020. There were no closures. We didn't have to wear masks. And most people would not have been able to identify Dr. Fauci in a police lineup. But by the end of March 2020, we were in the after of coronavirus. The whole world shut down because a virus one four hundredth of an inch of a human hand ripped the earth that weighs 13 billion trillion tons. Let me run by you one more time. A virus one four hundredth the width of the size of a human hair stopped the entire earth that weighs 13 billion trillion tons. When the virus hit, Amazon took the store and brought it to our front door. Netflix took the movies and brought it to our living room. Teladoc and telemedicine is adding thousands of doctors to its network. Grocery stores have moved quickly to curbside service, while Neiman Marcus, J. Crew, J. C. Penney, and Brooks Brothers, Hertz and Advantage Rental Cars, Lord and Taylor, True Religion, Ann Taylor, Lane Bryant, and Men's Warehouse have either resorted to online sales or have filed for bankruptcy protection. Zoom calls and working from home is the new normal. Even with the warped speed discovery of vaccines and boosters, getting back to pre-pandemic status is slow and unpredictable especially when it comes to the church. Because it seems like our vaccine works at Walmart. Our vaccine works at Target. Somebody ought to help me preach here. Our vaccine works at Vic and Anthony's. Our vaccine works at Papa Do's. But when it comes to the church, I got to be careful. The pandemic's primary effect has been to accelerate dynamics already present 10 years into the future. The primary effect of the pandemic has been to accelerate dynamics in society already present 10 years into the future. If your church had a weak balance sheet pre-pandemic, post-pandemic, you're about to close down. If you and your spouse were going through a rough spot pre-pandemic, post-pandemic, you can't stand each other. Home Depot and Lowe's are reaping huge benefits because people are tackling much needed 
and often neglected home improvements. We have painted, resurfaced, put up, taken down, remodeled, and restained kitchens, bathrooms, bedrooms, closets, cabinets, and decor. But the question is not what have we done, but what have we become? Your closet is organized, but what about your soul? Your kitchen is redone, but what about your attitude? You replace your carpet, what about replacing your pride? I wish I had two or three more witnesses here. If you have not done everything you wanted or accomplished everything you should have, Jesus Christ helps us to face the music even when we don't like the tune. <laughs> Phillips Brooks. Phillips Brooks, who is famous for saying preaching is truth through personality. Phillips Brooks says that our past, the best use of our past is to get a greater future out of it. The best use of our past is to get a greater future out of it. The way I look at it, brothers and sisters, this pandemic, you can either run from it or learn from it. God has sent the crest of a wave for the church to ride on, and if we miss it, we're going to be left behind because this is not God's first pandemic. God was there when the Red Sea turned and the people of Israel walked over on dry ground. God was there when the frogs and the lice and the darkness fell over Egypt. God was there when the firstborn Egyptians died and the children of Israel in Goshen had light on one side and darkness on the other side. This is not God's first rodeo. And those of us who are scared of what's going to happen tomorrow, I know who's bringing tomorrow. I know who is on my side. I know who's made a way for me in the past. And the God who brought me 20 years ago is still able to bring me this morning. The psalmist said, if it had not been, I wish I had two or three more witnesses, for the Lord who was on my side. My steps had almost gone. My feet had well nigh slipped when I saw how the wicked prospered and the righteous suffered. But I went into the sanctuary. And brothers and sisters, there's something about coming to church this morning. When the world is falling apart, God will put your life back together again. Is there anybody here? ever been through some storms in your life and God delivered you when it looked like your back was up against the wall God provided enough space for you to get to church on Sunday morning and help me declare trust in the Lord with all your heart lean not on your own understanding but in all your ways, come on, you can help me say it. Acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. You want another one? Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. His delight is in the law of the Lord and in that law doth he meditate both day and night, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. 
I got another one. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for God is with me. You want another one? The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Have I got a witness here? The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? You want another one? I've been young, but now I'm old. And I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed. Begging for bread. God will make a way for you. I said God will make a way for you. God will dry tears from your eyes. God will keep you till your hair turns. Is there anybody here know he's a keeper? Come on, why don't you look at somebody? You don't have to touch him. Just tell him God is a keeper. Stop letting the devil make you afraid of God. Stop letting the devil tell you everything is falling apart. Don't you waste this pandemic. Rise. Shine. Give God the glory. Yeah. For the children of Israel, for the children of Israel, I want you to get this. The wilderness for the children of Israel and for the sensitive ones of us in here this morning, the wilderness for them and for us is a schoolhouse. God has done for us in two years what it took him 40 years to do for Israel. The COVID-19 pandemic has been a wilderness experience of affliction bereavement, disappointment, and perplexity. But God, I said, but God has already anticipated. God has already disposed of. God has already adjusted. God has already ruled. God has already super ruled so that some people went through a divorce in a pandemic and you're still in your house. Some people lost their job and you're still working. Some folk lost their lives and you're not here this morning because you're wearing a mask. There's some folk who wore a mask who are in their grave. God kept you. Keep your, keep your hands sanitizer with you. But the scripture says, he that had clean hands and a pure heart who has not lifted up his soul under vanity nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive blessings from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of them that seek your face, O Jacob. Wear your mask if you want to, because you need to, because the numbers are going up. But behind that mask, don't be a hypocrite too. Because God can see behind that mask. 
God knows that you're acting like you're happy to see somebody, but behind that mask you can't stand them. You think God is not able to see the frown in your heart because of the mask on your face? Yeah. He's already went into your situation so that you can taste his love, keep his law, reflect his beauty, and if you are awake, you're getting ready for the next thing he wants to accomplish. Now, in the first four chapters of Deuteronomy, Moses recounts Israel's history with Yahweh. In chapter 5, he recites the Ten Commandments. In chapter 6, he recites the Jewish Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. In chapter 7, Moses begins to prepare the people for the day when they will enter the promised land, which brings us to chapter 8 with a call to remember the purpose of the hardships of the past are preparation for the blessings of the future. The, 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 the purpose of the hardships of the past are preparation for the blessings of the future. In other words, if you don't know anything about hardship, you have no appreciation for blessing. If you haven't fallen down, you're not thankful for standing up. And the reason some of us shout so loud is because we've fallen down many times. And the Lord does not come by and criticize us for falling and talk about us for falling. He just gets in the ditch with us, picks us up and puts us back on our feet again. And we are in this church this morning not because we are perfect, but because we've been forgiven. I want you to see, I want you to see in verse 2 and 3 as I hurry. In verse 2 and 3, he, he, he led them. Remember the long way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness in order to humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commandments. He humbled you by making you hungry, then by feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had ever seen before, in order to make you understand that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Maimonides. Maimonides, one of the most prolific and influential Torah scholars of the Middle Ages, whose writings hold a prominent figure in uh, Jewish intellectual history. Maimonides found it problematic that God would test Israel in order to learn something, which by implication meant that God did not know. God did not know something. I, I struggled with that in, in preparation for this message because I have no problem with God's omnipotence. I, I have no problem with God's omnipresence. But, but I have to study and research and dig into God's omniscience because God, when he dealt with Abraham, and Abraham was about to come down with, with his knife to kill Isaac, God sent an angel to stop him from killing Isaac, and God said, Abraham, don't, don't hurt the child, because now I know. And for God to say, now I know, suggests in my mind that there was something God did not know. 
And I know that there's nothing God cannot not know because God is omniscient and he knows everything. But I think what I'm trying to get at is although God knows everything, God doesn't force everything. God knows my actions, but God does not dictate my actions. God's foreknowledge is God knows where I'm going to be eating lunch after I leave here, but he don't make me go to Carabas. Because he has given me free will. And so God cannot make me love him. God cannot force me to come to church. God knows I'm going to be up here preaching on Sunday morning, but he doesn't make me get up. But God knows it because of our relationship. Somebody ought to help me preach here. God knew that Job would pass the test because he told Satan, go try Job since you ain't got nothing to do. And he said, he's serving you because you got a fence around him. Move the hedge and I'll make him crush you to your face. He sent Satan back because, listen, God will never send you a test you can't pass. Somebody ought to help me shout here. And, and then God will send you a test that's open book. And you got to be kind of slow to fail an open book test. The answers are in the book. I wish I had a witness here. God says to the children of Israel, I am going to send hardship. Here it is. To humble you. Hardship is to humble you. We parents make mistakes with our children when we let them have it too easy. They don't have any hardship. They don't know anything about struggle. They don't know anything about doing without. Christmas means nothing to our children because they get everything they want right now. Talk back to me if you can. I grew up in a time when there were no sippy cups at church. You, you didn't bring your coloring book and your doll. You, you, you didn't bring your iPad and your earphones. I grew up in a time when my mama said, sit down and don't move. And she was singing in the choir, and somehow she could see way in the back of the sanctuary. Somebody ought to help me preach it. Be be because... They made us do what was right, whether we wanted to do it or not. They made us learn the value of a hard day's work. Parents have to discipline children. Foolishness is bound up in them. But the route of correction would drive it far from them. In the military, some of you have served in the armed forces. In the military, you don't get up when you want. You don't decide what, what direction you're going to march in. They tell you how to march. They cut your hair as soon as you get there to make you know you ain't running nothing here. They decide when you eat, what time you eat, they decide what you eat because there has to be a, a, a modicum of discipline or else lives are lost. God brought them through the wilderness 40 years. God brought us through this pandemic two years to humble us. Be be because some of us have gotten so top heavy some of us have gotten so beside ourselves 
And I'm talking about churches, I'm talking about communities, I'm talking about everything that happens in the world. God said, you build these gigantic churches, you don't go to them anyway, so I'm going to shut them down. God says, uh, football and basketball and baseball has become your religion, and these stadiums are your sanctuaries, so I'm going to close that down. God said, you love money so much, I'm going to shut Wall Street down. God said, you want to go play golf and you want to go out to Galveston to the beach party on Sundays instead of coming to church? I'm going to shut the whole world down. What you going to do now? He had to humble us. I wish I had a witness here. God had to humble us if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked way. Then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sins, and heal their land. Not only did he humble them, but he had to prove them. That word prove means he had to put them to the test. It's like a, a car manufacturer, uh, a car manufacturer, GM or Mercedes, a car manufacturer uh, has these car tests where they run cars into the wall uh, to see the durability of the bumper, to see if the airbags are going to work, to see if how they designed it is going to work in a crash. God sent a crash in 2020 to see if our airbags are working. <laughs> to see if our fender is going to fold in the pandemic. I wish I had somebody to help me preach here. And some of us have failed the test because God tried to get you to see that just like he provided pre-pandemic, he's able to provide post-pandemic. He led them. But then he fed them. He fed them. During the pandemic when it first started, people were going crazy over toilet tissue. I guess there was a lot of eating going on. Or... I, I ain't trying to get into that. Because you know I can get into that. But people were knocking each other down for toilet paper. Then you couldn't find hand sanitizer. And then you couldn't find bleach. And then you couldn't find Lysol. Then a couple of days ago, baby formula was missing. And all kinds of shortage because of supply chain shortages. But I thank God this morning that with God and in heaven, there is no supply chain shortage. Can I help somebody right here? The scripture says, God made them hungry so he could provide something for them to eat. He made them hungry so he could provide. He made them hungry so he could provide. He made them hungry so he could provide. Watch this, watch this, watch this. I, I've been waiting to get to this part since, 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 since Wednesday. That word manna in the text is a word we use all the time and don't know where it came from. The word manna in the, you, you ain't gonna believe it when I tell you what the word means. 
The word manna in the book of Exodus, the word manna in Deuteronomy literally means, you ready? What you gonna call it? They looked on the ground and saw some what you gonna call it? Because they had never seen anything like that before, and all they could say is, "What man is this?" Somebody gonna get it in just a minute. They couldn't understand it. They'd never seen it before. And listen, God made them hungry so He could feed them, and He said, "Take just what you need for today." Because if you take more than you need, worms are going to get in it. It will spoil because now you're being greedy. You don't think I know how to provide for your needs? I've been waking you up every day for the last 80 years and you think I ain't got paper towels? I've been making a way for you for the last 43 years and you don't think I can protect you now? I will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on me. They went everywhere picking up what you gonna call it. Literally, what man is this he led him he fed him and he bred him b-r-e-a-d b-b-r-e-a-d b-r-e-a-d not bread like you bred cattle he bred them like he provided. Man. Uh. Man. Mm. Man. Uh. What? Man uh, of man is this. The same manna that fell in the wilderness is the same manna that came from heaven. Because when they met Jesus, they'd never seen a manna like this before. They'd never seen a man like Jesus before because Jesus was not the bread that was on the ground. He was the bread that fell down from heaven. And in the midst of their wilderness, he became bread for them. I'm through. I said, I'm through. But I'm glad this morning that I know what manner of man is this. He was on a little boat one night and a storm blew up and he was asleep in the hinder part of the ship and somebody had the good sense to wake him up and say to him, don't you care that we are about to perish? He stood on board that little boat and waved his hand and said, Peace, be still. And there was a great calm. And then the disciples looked at one another and said, What manner of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey him one night Jesus told them to go to the other side 
And he went on in the mountains apart to pray. And about four o'clock in the morning, he came walking on the water. And Peter said, Lord, if that's you, bid me to come on the water also. Jesus said to Peter to come on and walk with me on the water. And as long as he kept his eyes on Jesus, he was able to walk on water. But the moment he took his eyes off Jesus, he began to sink. And the reason why I'm not going to waste this pandemic, I'm going to keep my eyes on Jesus. And as long as I keep my eyes on Jesus, I don't care what the stock market is doing. As long as my eyes are on Jesus, I don't care what Wall Street is doing. As long as my eyes are on Jesus, I don't care what they run out of at HEB. As long as my eyes are on Jesus, I don't care who likes me or who does not like me. As long as I keep my eyes on Jesus, storm clouds may rise, strong winds may blow, but I tell the world wherever I go, I found a savior and he's sweet I know. Is there anybody here? No God is able. Is there anybody here had a manna experience in your own situation? God delivered you from your troubles. You ought to be able to testify what manner of man is this. God raised me off of my sick bed. My testimony is what manner a man is this somebody here was broke last year but God kept you in your car what manner of man is this somebody lost a loved one but you still got joy this morning what manner of man is this somebody's job almost fired you but God kept you on your job God kept you in your right mind God kept you with your health and strength. God kept you with food and family. God kept you with friends and finances. Why don't you say, what manner of man is this? He's able to make a way out of no way. He's able to pick you up, turn you around, place your feet on solid ground. You don't mind if I call him, do you? You don't mind if I talk about him a minute. I just feel like talking about him a minute because I know what manner of man is this. He's Adam's redeemer. He's Abel's vindicator. He's Abraham's sacrifice. He's Noah's ark. He's Moses' bush on fire. He's Joshua's battle axe. He's Gideon's fleece. Y'all know him, don't you? He's Samson's power. He's David's music. He's Solomon's wisdom. He's Mary's baby boy. He's James and Jude's older brother. He's Matthew's king. He's Mark's suffering servant. He's Luke's great physician. He's John's word made flesh. He's Acts coming of the Holy Ghost. He's the only begotten of the Father full of grace and truth he's the blessed and the only potentate he's the faithful and the true witness y'all know him don't you he's distinctive in supernatural capacity superlative in sovereign majesty exclusive in spiritual beauty radiant in eternal splendor matchless in supernal deity he's the god of gods he's the lily of the valley he's a bright morning star He's a way out of no way. He's a bridge over troubled water. He's a mother for the motherless. He's a father for the fatherless. He's a rock in a weary land. He's a shelter in a time of storm. Y'all know him, don't you? If you tried him and you're not ashamed to testify, if he brought you 
and you don't care who's looking at you why don't you wave your hand say what manner what manner of man is this what manner what manner of man is this I'm really finished now the other day over there in Japan they assassinated the former prime minister and I was listening to a podcast talking about Shinze Abe the prime minister former prime minister of Japan they assassinated him this past Friday shot him in the back shot him in the neck and he died before he even got to the hospital and what they were saying on the podcast was it was a political suicide because everybody he supported won their campaign and so they decided to kill Shinzo Abe because they wanted to kill his influence but what they said on the podcast was rather than killing his influence they made him even larger now more people are listening to him because if they had left him alone nobody would even know his name anymore but because he died he's now larger than life one Friday on a hill called Calvary one Friday on a hill called Calvary they nailed his hands they pierced him in his side they nailed his feet and if they had left him on the ground everything would have been all right but they made a mistake and they raised him up and when they raised him up they heard his words and I if I be lifted up from the earth I'll draw I'll draw I'll draw all men under me and Jesus died on the cross didn't he die they thought it was all over but bright and early Sunday morning God raised him up and because God raised him up you got dressed this morning came to this sanctuary you lifting your hands right now you opening your mouth right now not because he's dead but because he's alive 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 I know he's all Walks with me, he talks with me, he tells me I am his own, and the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. Has he been good to you? Has he made a way for you? Has he opened doors for you? Has he dried tears for you? Has he answered prayers for you? Tell him thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I know he's all right. them 
He fed them. And then he became bread for them. Man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. If you let him, he'll direct your path. If you let him, he'll make the rough places smooth. He'll make the crooked places straight. If you let him, he will send joy bells in your soul so that people will look at you and wonder why you're so happy, all the stuff going on in your life. You ought to look around and tell them, you don't know my story. You don't know what I've been through. You, 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 don't, you don't know how many doors God has opened for me. Where I came from, all the stuff I got myself in and God got me out of. And you telling me to shout, but be quiet. Don't, don't care on so much. Don't make so much noise. They told that to Bartimaeus one day. The Bible says Bartimaeus hollered louder. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And our brothers are standing now and our evangelism people are in the aisles. For some person or persons who are here today who can by an act of faith just exercise your faith, you can become a part of the family of God. God loves you so much that he sent his only son to die in your place. And if you would just trust him this morning, he would become savior and lord of your life. But you have to make that decision. These people can walk with you, but they can't walk for you. You have to do it now. There are some things I may not know. God is real. Praise the Lord for me. Oh, yes, God is real. God bless you. I see you coming. If you're in the balcony, we'll wait for you. However long it takes for you to get down here. God is real. For he has washed. Some folk may doubt. Just get up from your seat right now. Don't put it off another Sunday. Don't wait another week. You, you know God is speaking to you right now. You can hear his voice almost audibly. God is saying to you, you need to make a decision. You need to get in a church where you can grow and be the Christian I want you to be. And the devil is saying to you, not this Sunday, wait till next Sunday. But you may not live that long. You could die tonight without a hope in Christ. Do it today.
intent of your heart. If your heart is right, God doesn't care what you look like, where you've been, what you've done, or what you're up to. He loves you so much that he sent Jesus to die on the cross and his blood shed says not guilty. My sin, oh the bliss of that glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole were nailed to the cross and I bear them no more. Praise the Lord, oh my son. Oh yes, God is real. It's real in my soul. God is Tomorrow might be everlasting today. Oh, yes, God is real. Praise the Lord. Real in my soul. Yes, God is real. For he has won. Softly. When I was growing up in my little town in Eunice, where I'm from, we lived on Mueller Street after we moved from Lewis Street, then we went back to Lewis Street after my grandmother died. And my mother did not go to sleep until every last one of us got in the house. She, she'd sit in that recliner. I can see her right now with a cigarette hanging out of my Sitting in that recliner. But she would not fall asleep until every one of us got in the house. And when, the, when, when we touched the porch, she knew who it was. If he walked up the stairs sideways, that was Steve. If he jumped on the porch from the ground, that was Bobby. If he tried to sneak in through the window, that was Lee. And if he slept on top of the house, that was crazy Ray. Because he knew he couldn't come in after a certain hour, so he just slept on top of the house. My mama said, you're crazy enough to stay on top of the house? That's where you're going to stay. But she would not rest 
until all of us were in the house. The Lord Jesus Christ, the Spirit of God, will not rest until everybody who's supposed to be in the house is in the house. And, and then you might be saying, well, if God knows already who's going to be saved, why do we need to pray for people and evangelize people? Because we don't know. God knows who the elect are. But we don't know who the elect are. So that's why we ought to go in every hedge, every highway, and tell everybody about Jesus Christ. Because everybody talking about heaven ain't going there. Just because your name is on the roll at Lily Grove does not mean your name is on the roll in the Lamb's Book of Life. He that hath the Son has life. But he that hath not the Son has not life. And the wrath of God abides upon him. This may be your last opportunity. Thank God last night was not your last night. But you don't know what the next hour is going to bring. Yes, God is real. Give God the glory for these who have joined our church.